believe. Okay, so I want to thank everybody for being here to this um, August Sydney lectures. I think this will be a, a useful panel for people who are looking to find a job uh, and, or to share with your students or some of your colleagues. And hopefully it will also demystify this process for any young scholars in the group who want to know a bit more about how it works and how the process works. And so I will be going um, first um for probably half an hour 45 minutes i'll try to keep it as fast as i can and i'm going to skip over some stuff but there'll be some documents handouts that you can have access to and so um, you'll have the ability to get those and those can be found on the uh on the uh sydney lectures facebook page or send me a message directly i can send them to you if you need to get access to them and so let me go to my slides here real quick share screen Stop. Somewhere. There we go. Okay, so let me do a um, full screen on this for me. So if you if you have any trouble, I assume you can now see the slides. Those of you there, right? You can see the slides up. And um, thank you, Joy. I appreciate it. Um, so. You know how to market yourself. Uh, you know, uh, hone your employment skills, get a job, writing resumes, videos, interviews, etc. Now, I, I I'm going to briefly go through each of these areas. Like I said, quickly, there's a lot of details in the um, materials I've provided, the folders, and I'll open those and go through those. And I won't be able to go through all those, but I think I will be able to give you a pretty clear um, sense of what to expect. So, one more second. I think I have the wrong version i added one slide to this see D don't do what i did in the future right one more try um august lectures slides I had all this set. I'm just going to go here for the first slide, then I'll come back to it. Okay, so um, this first slide, some practical issues to think about. Um, I, I think this is one of the things that for most people, they probably don't appreciate when they're out looking for a job. And that is to understand that the hiring process isn't rational. Um, we, we pretend it is and we create um, job advertisements that we want to be very clear and that we want to include certain things for people who are applying for the job. But then also all sorts of things happen because you don't know who's going to be on that hiring committee. And sometimes the hiring committee is a group of people who are experts in the area, but other times it's a group of people who know very little about the area. So for example, when I interviewed for my job here, um, there was really nobody who would, I, who would be known as a, a public relations scholar on the committee. And the senior committee, there were sort of two committees, a school-wide committee and then uh, administrators. None of the administrators knew anything about my area of expertise or, or myself personally or anything else. And so um, you have to appreciate that this is a somewhat irrational process. If you expect rationality and if you expect logic, you're going to be disappointed. But once you, I think, understand that it's oftentimes not entirely logical, it, you, you can feel a little bit better about not getting a job offer if you don't get one or something like that. And then understand that every school is different. So we've got seven or eight guests today, if everybody shows up, who will talk to you about their, what they've done in their hiring process. And I put together a whole list of questions for them to think about that they can sort of talk about any of them that they want to. And you'll see that there are very different, things are done very differently from school to school. And so different timelines, different groups of people, different expectations about how to do it. 
Um, one of the things that's typically common, though, is that the final decision is made by a senior person, like a dean or something like that. So you have a group of people who interview you, and you might be their top pick, and maybe there was four people or five people on the committee. You were their favorite person. They picked you because they think you're the best, and um, we pass on our recommendation to um, us, to some administrator who makes a decision about which one of the people to pick. And we've we've typically prioritized the top three choices with our number one choice, usually the, you know, at the top of the list. And then the administrator says, no, I don't like any of these people. Go back and find me somebody else. Or the administrator picks number three on your list and says, that's the person I want to bring in. So again, when I tell you about it being irrational, you just have to understand that you know, often we try to make the best decision. We try to get the best people. We try to bring in good people, but we don't always have control over the process. So don't feel bad. If you don't get the job, if you don't get the offer, you should never think it's a flaw with you. Now, as you'll see, when I go through the rest of this, there are things you might be doing wrong and you could make a more compelling case. Um, but if you don't get the offer, even if you have the best case in the world, that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you. It just means, you know, shit happens. I think that's the technical term for it. Um, yes, I can do that in one second. Okay. So uh, there are different, um, often inside candidates. I think there's always this rumor, it's not a rumor, but there are often inside candidates. There's maybe somebody who works at the school, somebody who's lecturing at the school that a lot of people like. But I can say from my own personal experience, having you know hired people and been on committees, they don't always get the job. Um, oftentimes, there are jobs that are sort of created with that person in mind, and they write the job ad so that it fits the skill set of this person they want. That's quite common, um, but uh, that doesn't mean they're going to get it. If they interview poorly, if somebody better comes along, and everybody's like, wow, that person's amazing. We want to hire that person. Um, that's often going to take precedence. So I would say, don't get too concerned about whether there is an inside candidate, but, but yes, there are sometimes inside candidates you're competing against. All right, not being the top candidate doesn't mean you will not get hired. Um, this is often true. You know, I, there are many times that the very best people out there apply to a whole bunch of different schools, and they might get three offers or four author offers or even mm -hmm. more. And there are probably only a handful of people out there in the, in the pool who are like that. Okay, so let's say this, in any particular year, we're looking to hire 50 or 100 people. Three or four of them get five offers or three offers, but the rest of the people don't. Okay, those people, though, will be discriminating and they'll be able to pick the school they think is best and they'll be able to make a choice, but they'll turn down all those other schools. So being the second choice doesn't mean that you're somehow inferior and very often you'll wind up being an excellent person and being quite happy. Um, but just be aware that sometimes it can take longer than you thought. It, if you weren't the first choice, it got offered to somebody else and that person turn them down, or sometimes that person says, maybe let me have time to think about it, and then they turn them down. And so then they call you maybe three weeks later than they said they would, and they say, we'd like to make you an offer. So don't feel bad about that. There's no shame in that. It doesn't mean you were you know, not as good, and, and it's just a matter. That's how the process works. And so just be aware of that. Some of people may talk about the timeline uh, when it's their turn to talk, but, but um, you know, understand that it varies from school to school, like I said. And then applying for jobs is a lot of work. If you're teaching, um, and if you've got a job already and you're looking to get a new job, you're teaching classes, you're still doing research, and then you have to sort of sneak away to, to other universities to look for a job if you're an assistant professor, or if you're just a graduate student and you're working on your thesis and you're working on, and you may be teaching as well. It's a very time consuming, very hard, tedious process. So just, you know, I have nothing to say about that. Just be aware of that. You know, it's not something easy. It, it, it's difficult, time consuming, it's hard. And that's just how it works. All right. And if at any point you want to stop and ask me a question as I'm going through this, I'm, I can, this it won't throw me off. I'm happy to just respond to something if, you, if as mm -hmm. I'm talking, you want to ask something. All right. So then these are some issues to understand. Understand that you're selling yourself here. You need to make a compelling case. You want to be seen as the best candidate out of everyone applying. I don't like thinking about what we do that way, but, but that is the fact. You know, if, if I'm looking to hire somebody and I've got 10 applicants, I'm going to want to pick the best person in the pile of, you know, of applicants. And you need to be that best person. You need to make yourself be seen as that best person, which means being able to present yourself well. And we'll talk more about letter writing and that stuff in a few minutes. But I mean, that means you don't write a three-page letter of application. No one wants to read a three-page letter of application. 
And so you need to sell yourself effectively, being aware of the constraints, and hopefully that will get demystified today. Um, what matters is what the school wants. This is something you need to keep in mind, not what you want, okay? I know that, again, that's sad, but in this case, they are the customer. They're looking to hire you. You're looking to get a job with them. If it's in their job ad, that's what you want to talk about. You bring up things that aren't in the job ad, that's okay. But if you haven't responded to what's in the job advertisement, you're missing the point. And you want to use the exact language that's found in the job ad. If they use a particular phrase and say, we're looking for somebody who can teach blah, blah, blah. When you write your letter, you say, I can teach that. Even if it's not something you've taught, but it's similar to what you've taught, has a different title, use their words. You want them to be able to relate to you effectively and to see you as a person who understands them. And then you need to identify with them, which is again, part of using their language and speaking about it properly and knowing something about the place. For any job I've ever gone to, I researched the, the city I was going to. If I'd never been there before, I wanted to know what was it like? What's it like to live in that town? What's it like to live in that state? Is it a, you know, a, a liberal or conservative state? You know, Sometimes the politics of the place matter. Are they you know, um, going to see someone like me as an outsider or somebody that they can embrace? So these are just some basic issues. So let me get into some more details here. I'm going to go through each of these, um, again, separately, but briefly, resumes, vetoes, letters, and interviewing. And first off, for an academic job, resumes are sort of irrelevant. Uh, we typically don't care about a resume for a job, an academic job. It does, like I said, it, it varies everywhere how things are done. And so sometimes um, people will have... Uh, just a second, I'm trying to get my windows set up here so I can see people. And sometimes people will ask for something and call it a resume, but they mean a Vita. But in general, for an academic job, you're gonna create a Vita. And you should create a Vita now if you don't have one, and you're gonna keep that Vita up to date for the rest of your career. You know, And your Vita grows roughly a page a year. So the longer you've been out, the bigger your Vita is. I've looked at people's you know, senior administrators who have 75 page Vitas. And um, they aren't 75 years old, but that just means they've done a lot of things every year throughout the years. And so um, resumes, vetoes, letters. Let me just briefly touch on resumes here. So um, your basic resume looks something like this one over here on the right. I'm going to show you in the folder I linked you to. There's like 50 sample resumes, and I'll flip through those really quick in a second. Um, but resumes have design features and content features. They have things people are looking for, and they have things that people expect to see, and they expect them to look a certain way. And in our field as professional communicators, um, we're not typically a high, high visual, high graphic field. People aren't expecting fancy resumes with pictures, mm -hmm. charts, and tables. We're expecting readability. And the key is that. Use bolding sparingly, but use some of it. Have some white space, space things out. So... Um, in the folder, and I'm actually not even going to go there because I want to try to keep this my part short today, but in the folder, there's a file called uh, the Dis a Disney resume, a PDF for Disney Corporation and their resume instructions. It's like best practices from everyone, okay? Disney tells you, use a readable font, have lots of white space, don't put a picture of yourself on it. Um, there's a whole list of what you should do when you apply for a job with Disney. And then they've got a sample resume for Snow White, who's bilingual and speaks Spanish, in case you didn't know that about Snow White. And um, it's an excellent document, really is an excellent tool for just the basics of what to do in a, in a re standard resume. So that's there because Disney took it down off their website. Um, it was there for about a decade. They revised it a couple times and made it look more fancy, but never changed the content of the information. So I have one of the one of the versions that I downloaded over the years available for you. Uh, and so the Disney resume page is a good document to take a quick look at. And then I have a one page document about what a resume does in general, the purpose of a resume, what it's for. You'll find a thousand people uh, in organizations or whatever who will tell you about what you should do in a resume. And many student services, people in student services will tell you. And my advice is to ignore them. Okay, listen to me. Um, I'm not necessarily saying I'm 100% right, but what I do know is what my field expects communication, public relations. Um, mm -hmm. We do not expect a resume that has your picture on it. In fact, in some places that's illegal. You should not be putting your picture on your resume. Mm -hmm. It has a potential for people to be biased because of you know how you look. They can either like you because of how you look or not like you because of how you look. And so marketing might do that and advertising might do that, but it's something we typically don't. 
Uh, I think Regina just just showed up. So I think that's almost that's everybody or almost everybody who's supposed to be here. So just um, take a look at some of the suggestions. And then I'm going to go to that folder here in just a second. There's a, a big folder of sample resumes. And most of those samples are what not to do's. So it's a big folder of bad resumes for you to take a look at. And then I have a document on, on writing goal statements. So let me see if I can find that folder real quick and go through that with you. And it all set up and then my thing fill. All right, so resume. In the resume stuff folder, um, there's the Disney resume that I told you about. And these are Disney's tips for writing a resume. Uh, you know, resumes, some of the old stuff that, that doesn't, again, this doesn't matter for most of us for academic jobs, but a lot of resumes are scanned into databases. They aren't actually looked at by human beings. And that's why it's, it really matters that you don't do like two column resumes, multi-column resumes, because the scanner will just read across the lines and everything will be unintelligible. It doesn't know that this heading refers to this so section over here when you scan it into a scanner. So there are pragmatic reasons why we don't make the fancy resumes that we often see as samples. And Disney talks about these. This is from 20 years ago, right? There's nothing new here. It's just that, you know, 20 years ago, people were aware of this. You definitely want to know these things. So you can take a look at that. You have access to it. And then the resume document itself has just a, um, I think this is actually my, uh, a sample resume, a sample professional resume for me. Where's my resume handout? Uh, resume handout. Okay. So there's a res the resume handout just goes through some of the things in terms of content and aesthetics. You know, lots of white space. Let me make this bigger so you can see it. Um, lots of white space, um, using a, a standard font, um, standard size, keep the resume short. These are the kinds of things, some content decisions about what you do, and then some aesthetic decisions. Don't put it on colored paper. You know, people I've seen husband and wife applicants turn in the resumes the husband on blue paper, the wife on pink paper. Okay, we, we don't do that. Okay, that's not what professionals do. Uh, and so um, make it look as professional as possible. You want it to look like something that would be used by some as a final draft professional document. You don't double space it like you do a class paper because I think that's a mistake a lot of people make with their early documents is they, they double space everything. They double space business letters. Mm -hmm. We do that as students, but we don't do that anymore when we're, when we're professionals, you know, books aren't double spaced, they're single spaced, but the manuscript of the book is double spaced so you can proofread it. So this is just the basic suggestions on a resume and some miscellaneous stuff and then some phone etiquette, not as big a deal as it used to be because everyone has cell phones now, but in the old days you could live in a place with several people in the same phone. So there's just some advice to tell your friends not to be dumbasses when they answer the phone and stuff like that. So mostly um, these were advice for undergraduates. Um, uh, so anyway, you've got that document you can take a look at if you need to put together a resume. And then I've got a sample of resume of my own from professional consulting resume. And then this, I think you should take a look at too, if you're making a resume, our goal statements. It's quite common for people to have these goal statements or these statements on their resumes where they say stuff like, I'm hardworking, dedicated, you know, employee, um, reliable. And they have this whole list of adjectives of, that they can do. Well, everybody has that list on their resume. And that's a meaning, meaningless list when every applicant has a list that says almost the same thing on it. Writing a good goal statement takes some skill. And as a professional communicator, you should be able to do it. So there's a whole bunch of samples. I put some you know, text describing what the goal statement's all about, what you can do with a good goal statement. And then there's some statements here of goal statements of things. You know, So I've seen this before, You know, controlled membership verification, which doesn't mean anything. It means you signed up new members. Just say you signed up new members, right? Don't make up, try, try to make up fancy language. You want to be straightforward and clear about what you say in a resume. So this has some thou shalt nots, what you should and shouldn't do for goal statements. And then some sample goal statements up here. Um, this is one of my students in Jersey. You know, it was a long time, fan of the Jersey Devils. I've always dreamed of working with a professional sports team, right? So make the statement, the goal statement be something specifically about you and your skill set and what it is that you're looking for. So unless there are questions, that's all I'm going to say about, um, I think, resumes. I think we're going to, we're going to, uh, yes, close all tabs. Hold on. We're going to move on. So you got some stuff there in the resume folder, some suggestions. Oh, yeah, I just wanted to take a quick look at that resume folder for you. Sample resumes, whatnot. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, sort of scan through these quickly. 
to give you an idea, right? So this two column layout, like I said, has problems. If your document gets scanned into a computer and other kinds of things, avoid it. So not a good example of what you should or shouldn't do. Same thing with this one. These are all you know, fake resumes or resumes I found online. But this sort of thing, this was this has been quite common that I've seen where people use this little bubble chart or sort of five point scale or seven point scale to talk about their skill with something, you know, put into words. We want to know that you can write. We are a writing oriented profession in communication and public relations, writing and speaking, um, typically not building graphics, designing graphics In PR. We do some of that. So um, make it compelling. And so I would say, like I said, you can take a look at this folder. Um, I'm just going to scan through quickly the, the two color columns and big NO. Very likely this yellow would scan quite poorly into a scanner. Um, it's not something you'd want to have. And a lot of these have people's pictures on them or pictures of things. And we don't do that. Like I mentioned, black on white scans poorly. White on black scans very poorly and is hard to read. So there's a whole bunch of samples in here. Like this is horrible. Never do something like that ever. That's a nice infographic, but that's not a resume. Um, and so I found some resumes that, that are sort of okay. Like this is closer to what you're looking for, except no picture of, of Fernando there, of Peter. And um, again, the two columns can mean problems if it's looked at electronically. Same thing here, the two columns. This is better to not have the two columns, but this is just way too dense, way too much text, not readable, no bolding, you know, limited bolding a little bit. Um, uh, uh, just again, a poor choice. And th again, I shouldn't have to say anything about that. Th these are horrible. Okay. So anyway, what you'll find mostly like not so bad, not so bad, nah, you know, not good with the two columns, same thing. No, 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 maybe. Right. So this is just some samples for you to see what you pretty much don't do in a resume. All right. We're done with that. Save that folder and come back to it. All right, so resume, resume handouts, that's what you got there. Now let's talk Vitas, which are ultimately more important for professor, for, for academic jobs, all right? There is a um, sample um, Vitae, there's a folder that you can find with sample Vitae from about 25 different people. Um, Beth Avery's is in there actually. If Beth, if you don't want me to have it tell me. I removed personal information from people's resumes so you don't have their, their cell phone numbers and their stuff like that. But I requested Vitas from people all over many years to use in classes when I'm teaching students about it. So I have gotten Vitas with permission of people. I haven't just taken people's Vitas that I ran across and used them without permission. But it's a, it's a, a there's a folder full of Vitas that you can see some stuff and I'll talk about that in a bit. And then there's a sample, a handout on sample Vitas. And then I've got one of my own Vitas, uh, my current Vitas and um, an early Vita for you to see. So let's go back to this folder here. And go to the Vita folder. All right, and actually, let's look at the sample Vitas for a second. When I made my first Vita as a undergraduate student, my professors told me you need a Vita when you're going to graduate school. So before I even applied to my first master's program, I put together a Vita, which was horrible. But um, once I became a master's student, I redid it and tried to make it better. And um, but, but what I did is I asked for a copy of all my professors' Vitas, and I just studied them. I looked at them, and, and one of them I don't remember which one. Um, I think my advisor's Vita was just horrible. It was in a typewriter font. It was so hard to read. It was terrible. And um, that was one of the universalities that you see when you look at people's Vitas applying for jobs is they're often horrible. It's like you're applying for a, a communication oriented job and maybe you wanna teach public relations writing and you can't put together a readable Vita. You can't put together a Vita that's easy to read and compelling and interesting. You've jammed everything into a 10 point times typeface with no bolding, or you've used a typewriter font. And so just be aware that you want your Vita to be a compelling sales tool for you. It needs to be easy. It needs to be readable. It needs to be, it needs to have what we expect. So um, this is uh, this is alphabetical. So Elizabeth's first, and actually this is pretty good, a pretty good sample. So I'm I'm not going to say anything about it. But Carl Botan's Vita, this is in a sans serif typeface. We don't use sans serif typefaces because it doesn't scan well. So even though you may like a sans serif typeface, if if it's going to be a potential situation where your Vita might need to get scanned into a system, you want to have it into in a serif font, you know. So something like I don't like Times, but something like Times. So you can see categories, 
Um, I'm going to take you to the handout here about what Avita does here in a second, but there's different categories, it's different things. Carl's part up here could use some more white space bet between these sections, but when you look at like his articles, there's plenty of white space there. So you've got a bunch of sample Vitas. I don't know who this was, but it's um, uh, somebody else's. So there's a whole bunch of sample. I mostly put these in for you to look at and, and kind of do what I did and say, what does a Vita look like, right? Here are 25 Vitas from people to get a, a good feel about what a good Vita does. You need to make your own decisions, okay? Apart from it being highly readable, having some white space and stuff like that, the, your Vita, not every Vita looks the same, right? As long as it's readable, legible, makes a compelling case for you. That's what's important. So look at a bunch of the samples, see what you think is, is good and works for you. This was Lisa Falls, one of my colleagues, and um, Maria Hoy also, like I said, I got a bunch of these from my colleagues one year before I left Tennessee. Um, this is John Leipzig, who I, was one of my professors I mentioned from when I was an undergraduate. This was John's, it was in a typewriter typeface, and, um, you know, and it's got all these little columns of stuff that he's put everything into columns. And it's not, there's nothing that stands out. There's no bolding here. There's no, you know, bold headings, underlined headings. In the old days, we used underlining instead of bolding. Uh, so that's okay. Back then, we didn't have bolding typefaces that you could use in your typewriter. But anyway, you know, courses taught. Um, there are different kinds of, of Vita that people create. So Vita is singular and Vitae is plural. And there are different kinds of Vitas. And if you're looking for a job, a teaching job, in a school that emphasizes teaching, then you you want to emphasize teaching in your Vita. Is somebody asking a question? I'm getting a little static. I just want to check. Okay. Um, and if you're applying for a job at a school that emphasizes research, you want to lead with research. Lead with your research, your compelling research. It's common to have a couple Vitas when you're looking for a job, to have a sort of a teaching Vita and a research Vita. So if you're looking for a job at a teaching school, you're going to lead with the teaching stuff, the classes you've taught, the areas you've, things you've done. If you're looking for a research job, you're going to lead with the research stuff. And uh, where are we at? So you've got this folder full of sample Vitas, and I'm not, uh, none of them are, are horrible, but you'll, you should be able to look at it from a distance and say, oh, not bad. That's readable, right? That's readable. That's readable. And eh, not as readable. This was one of my professors from, you know, from when I was an undergraduate. So I would assume Marsh's would be better now than it was back then. Uh, so some sample Vitas so you can take a look at what they look like. And um, then let me go back here. So the um, this was my one of my early my Vita from 2001. I have my Vita from 2001, my Vita from 2021, just so you can sort of see the difference. If you looked at my early Vita, I, I led with teaching because I didn't have a bunch of research to talk about. I, I could talk about my teaching case. Started with my education, had teaching, what are the places I've taught, what are the schools, what are the courses that I've taught, that sort of thing. And then I had publications and research and it was a short list back then competitive papers, conference papers, et cetera. Here's one of the things to keep in mind. If you don't have a category, you don't put it on your Vita. But then when you do have something in that category, then you add the category to your Vita. So the first time you do an edited chapter, you add edited chapters to your publication section. The first time you do an invited chapter, you add invited chapters. You don't have a bunch of empty sections with nothing in it. But when something new comes along, you can then add that to your Vita, it becomes a new section. So everybody's Vita in some ways is different, e even if they're you know, similar in terms of how they look mm -hmm. from the beginning, they're, they're gonna have different categories, different structure. So you have a couple samples, and then just let's take a look at the Vita handout for a second. This is like the resume writing handout with some suggestions about what to do, what's the purpose of a Vita. So the Vita is a rhetorical document, which is basically explaining what you've done as no. an academic. And your Vita typically has everything you've ever done on it as an academic. It has um, every university you've worked at. It has every course you might have taught. It has every guest lecture you gave. It has every, it doesn't have every boring meeting you attended, but it would have every meeting you chaired, um, anything you were the chair of or that you were the leader of, uh, anything you did for training you might put on your Vita, sometimes even if it's required by your school. If you, so I've gone to, um, I've gone to training in, in how to, um, what's it called, unconscious bias training. So when you're hiring, how to avoid 
acting on your unconscious biases. And that might be a good thing to put on your Vita. I would say that is a good thing because that shows that you're aware of something that might be useful as an academic down the road. But basically anything you do professionally as an academic goes on your Vita. Your Vita is not consulting. Your consulting stuff doesn't, you could have a section on consulting and you could refer to some of your consulting. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, I have a section of some consulting on my Vita, but the purpose of the Vita is an academic thing. And that's the primary focus is gonna be on academic stuff. So there's some suggestions here, like different components, your education, your research, different sections. You can look at the sample Vitas for some of that. But so for example, I have refereed and peer reviewed articles. And I have professional articles when I did something professionally, like uh, I did a program evaluation on Ethiopia once and I wrote a, um, you know, I wrote a evaluation for that. And I might have a section on, on my Vita for something like that. Um, reports, invited articles, book chapters, book reviews, etc. And then panels, professional presentations, academic lectures, teaching stuff, grants, awards, all of these. And there's, you know, probably a hundred more categories. So Avita can have any a category in almost anything. If it seems like you've got more than one of something, you create a category for it so that you've got a separate category for those things that are that are related. It's not a toy, okay. It is not a toy. Oh, Ooh. sorry. It's all right, no worries. Um, Vita is definitely not a toy. It's usually, uh, well, anyway, final things to keep in mind on this is um, you should update your Vita all the time, okay? So anytime you do anything, put it on your Vita or have a folder where you put that stuff to put on your Vita later. When you're an academic looking to, um, you know, to build your career and stuff like that, everything you do that can go on your Vita, it's really easy to forget. In three months, you can forget some boring meeting on something you attended that might be useful for adding to your Vita. Or you forget a paper you submitted because it didn't get accepted, um, but maybe later you're going to use it for something else. So on my Vita, for example, for papers, I have a, I, I do three things with them. I, sub, I put them on my Vita first as submitted. And then when it's accepted, assuming it's accepted, I change submitted to accepted. And then once I've presented it, I change accepted to presented. So the category has a label that I typically just put in red because if I'm not sending it out for a job, I just keep it up to date so it's easy to use. But it goes on your Vita so you don't forget it. It's really easy to forget stuff. You want to keep your Vita up to date. Even if your school doesn't want a Vita, it's impossible to recreate years worth of academic stuff down the road when you go looking for a new job. If you don't keep your Vita up to date, you will never be able to recreate all those things you did. Like I said, if it grows a page a year and um, you're, you wait five years to update your Vita, you've lost five pages of stuff. And apart from your publications and stuff and classes, you'll never be able to update that easily. So just keep that in mind for the Vita. Keep it up to date. Be aware of the purpose of it and what it's for. And um, let me get rid of that. that. All right. So, and then letters. A lot of people ask about writing letters. What do you do? How do you do them? What's the purpose? Writing letters for job applications is standard in any kind of professional job. And for most, almost all academic jobs, they want a letter of application, a VITA, sometimes evidence of your teaching, letters of recommendation or names of people who are going to be recommenders for you, and, and sometimes a statement of your teaching principles, and sometimes a statement of diversity. So there's all kinds of things that are asked for, and some of the speakers will mention those to you. But um, the letter is your opportunity to focus the reader on something of importance that you think will, they will like. And it's a chance for you to talk about what you did of importance to them. I put in a bunch of sample letters in a folder, mostly letters of recommendation that I've written for people and a couple of them letters uh, of my own where I've applied for jobs that I didn't get. But just so you could see the sort of format, Matt, of what a letter looks like. I will tell you, like I mentioned before, what not to do. I don't care who you are, your letter is typically not more than two pages long, okay, with small exceptions, like, like Australia and New Zealand sometimes want 400 things, and the like job application says cover all of these things, and so it might take four pages to do all that, and if you're told to do it, you do it, but for a, a job in most other places like the U.S. and 
and um, Canada and other places, they don't expect you to write a letter over a page and a half or two pages. And if you're new, you shouldn't have more than two pages of stuff to talk about. You know, you're just stretching. It's bad writing. You're wasting people's time. So keep the keep the letters short. Uh, not half a page though. It's not a job, you know, for in business, you know, where maybe if it's over half a page, they get angry with you because you've made them read too many words. These are people who are smart and know how to read, but they want you to include important information so we can know you. So for all intents and purposes, this is a pitch letter. You're selling yourself to these people. You want to focus their attention. You use their language from their job ads. You talk about what they asked for. You, you say you can teach things that they want you to teach. There are different kinds of letters. I think probably at least a dozen different kinds of letters that you might write as a professional. For our purposes, the basic is sort of a business letter. A, a letter looks like a business letter. There's a sample here of, of you know, what it looks like on this page, but in the folder on letters, there's a sample business letter format, several documents about how to write a, a professional business letter, what it should look like. Um, and a pitch letter is something we write when we're trying to get publicity for an event or something like that. And in some ways, this is a pitch letter. It's not exactly a pitch letter, so don't copy the guidelines for a pitch letter. But essentially, you're selling yourself, which makes it a pitch letter. It's a sales document. You've got a graduate school application letter, which you're all beyond if you're looking for an academic job, but it just gives some insight into the, you know, what are people looking for so you can see the difference. And then cover letters in general. Um, so in the folder on letters, which I'll go to in just a second, there's a whole bunch of documents there explaining things to you. And so let me just briefly um, show you those real quick. One more person who just got here. All right. So in the sample resume, Vita. Uh, oh, maybe it's just back here. I don't remember where I put it. Pitch letters. Okay, so there's a, a document here about what is a pitch. With some, I think a pitch letter from one of my students, a sample pitch letter. Pitching and pitch letters. This is just an explanation of what pitch letters do. Um, writing graduate school letters is sort of, if you're applying for a job as a graduate student, you're applying to get a, an assistantship, this is the kind of thing you might think about. And that's similar. And then interview um, business letters themselves. Here's what there's a whole bunch of samples of what a business letter does. So the first couple explain it, have some stuff highlighted, but this is what a business school looks like. Just read through this if you've never paid attention to a business letter uh, or what a business letter does. Um, you know, business letters are typically short, page and a half, like I said, max. Um, they're left justified, ragged right margin. These are things that are just expected. If you have, if you don't want to have a ragged right margin, it's not a deal breaker, but you have to hyphenate. You don't get to not hyphenate and then have big gaps between your words and your lines. So this explains just sort of the details of what a business letter does. Why do you do it? How should it look? There's several samples in here. Um, as I said, the first two are really the same thing, just done twice. Um, then there's um, a letter of recommendation I wrote for Denise Ferguson to just give you a feel of the tone. And then another one I wrote for some other people, um, student for some award and stuff like that. So these are not job application letters, although there's some in here. This is one I wrote when I tried wanted to go to New Zealand. So Petra might have seen it, which I also did get that job. But um, this was one where they asked for, like I said, a shit ton of stuff. So it's longer than it would normally be. And anyway, so that's some samples for you. And I, um, I'm not going to drag you through all of those. There's a document I'm going to go through here in just a second. I'm almost done. I want to wrap this up in the next few minutes, but um, with some interview questions, I'm just going to show this to you now so I don't have to open it. Years ago, I started putting together sample questions that we that you might get asked on an interview. A lot of the, some of these, not a lot, but some of these are questions we might ask um, somebody looking, years ago, this was for when we'd interview um, high school students to get into our program. So there's some questions that you might ask of a high school student. But most of these are things that you might ask of any job applicant, like, uh, why do you want to work at our organization? Or why do you think you might like to work for our company? Or what do you know about our company? Um, when I'm applying for a job, I work out an answer. I've worked out an answer to every single one of these questions on this list, except for the ones that, that obviously don't apply to me. And I work out an answer that I can answer verbally in a, in a compelling way, quickly, um, easily. And I've practiced all of these with Maureen Taylor. Let me tell you, she's, she's a harsh taskmaster and she, she does not let me just keep talking. She's like, no, that's horrible. So do it again. You know, even if I think it's great, she makes me do it again. You should do the same. Find somebody who's just brutal, who will be critical. Ideally, though, somebody who is in the same field knows what's expected in an answer. But she used to make me practice 
being able to explain Grunig and Hunt's categories. And I'm like, no one's going to ask that. They might ask you. So, you know, like I had the categories memorized and I could talk about them. No one ever asked me about Grunig and Hunt's categories. But I, you know, but that doesn't matter. It prepared me for anything so that when the interview comes and they're asking you stuff, what books have you read recently? We've asked that of applicants before. And we asked an applicant once a number of years ago at a school that I won't name um, what his most, um, what the most compelling um, person was that he used in his dissertation, right? Who was the most compelling compelling scholar or researcher? And this person couldn't answer that question. And we're like, and I rephrased it and said, because I asked that question, I said, well, can you name somebody? Couldn't even name somebody. Couldn't even name a single person that he had used in his dissertation. One name, right? You need to be able to answer any question on this goddamn list, right? If you want to be a good applicant, you've practiced all these questions. Some of these questions are illegal, okay? They're in, illegal, at least in the U.S. Uh, and probably many other countries. I left them on there on purpose because it's good to learn how to answer an illegal question. And the correct answer isn't, that's an illegal question. I don't want to answer it, Okay. The correct answer is to answer it in a way that makes it clear you understand it's an inappropriate question, but doesn't say you're a dumbass for asking me about this inappropriate question. Learning to answer the questions is a very important part of this, learning to be a good interviewer, interviewee. So there's a whole bunch of list of sample questions. And I think, you know, of the list of 94 of them, probably 75 of them are are worth practicing and the others are probably not necessarily relevant. Take a look at them yourself. Let me go back to here and I'm almost done, I, I think, hopefully. So letters, business letters, interviewing. Um, so interviewing for a job is stressful. Uh, when you're early career, it's especially hard because you really need a job when you don't have one. Or if you're new and you've only had one job, you're not all that famous or important. So when you're coming to apply for your second job, it's still stressful and nervous for you. Someday down the road, when you're influential and sought after and you know famous, the interviews can be quite enjoyable. You get to go meet new people. They ask you sometimes hard questions that you get to talk about, and it's actually not that bad. But when you're really young and hungry, it's a different thing than when you're you know old and lazy and you're looking for a different job. So just be aware that the interviewing process is, is typically stressful, and so you want to minimize it. So practice, as I think I've implied, practice answering questions, research the organization. I can't tell you the number of people who've come in and didn't even know who any of the faculty members were, didn't know what our research areas were, who came in for jobs, didn't know what we studied, had never read an article. You know, we brought a woman in once who basically was lauding an area that I've written about as being not useful in the field. And I gave her a chance to rephrase the question three times. And she just kept saying the same thing. Activists are bad. They're the worst thing for organizations. Activists are such a pain in the ass. And I let her try to fix it several times. And she had no idea that, you know, like I study activism and activists aren't a bad thing. Activists are actually quite good. We just need to learn to work with them. So you need to have practiced. You need to have done research. You need to know who the people are. You need to know the language that they speak in terms of the, gene, the, the jargon that they use, the language that they use, the terminology that they use. Some other little things, leave your phone in the car or your bag, especially if you're a phone addict who can't stop looking at your phone, okay? Like I can leave my phone in my pocket all day and never look at it. Put it on sleep so it doesn't beep at you and make you wanna look at it. You don't need it for anything, leave it at home. Uh, make sure you've gone through your social media and scrubbed it so there's nothing in there inappropriate for somebody to run across. We shouldn't have to tell people that in this day and age, but people still post things that are inappropriate when they go looking for jobs. Not as big a deal, again, when you're a senior person, but when you're a young scholar, you don't want somebody wandering across something that seems inappropriate that they might want to use against you. Do some research and know the people, prepare for the predictable questions, practice your answers, have your story worked out, right? When they ask you, why do you want to come here? Um, Why is it that you think you'd be a good fit for our school? You want that answer worked out. You know, like when I came to Australia, I was sure they were going to ask me, why do you want to come to Australia? Why would you want to come here? It was a hard question for me. I struggled with it when I was applying for the job. No one asked me that goddamn question when I was on the interview, but I was prepared. And that preparation played out in other places. I could bring it up and I could say, well, you know, when I was trying to decide why to come here, I had an answer, right? I could pull that out and throw it out to answer a different question. So have your story worked out. 
keep your answers fairly short, about 15 to 30 seconds or maybe a minute at the most. You don't want to drone on for three or four minutes answering a question. Um, use heuristics. So have your questions practiced and structured. So you can say, okay, look, there are three issues. And I use that so many times. How would you teach a class on public relations writing? Well, look, there are three things I think you should think about. The first is this, the second is this, the third is this, boom, right? You got a good answer. It's worked out. It's easy to follow. It sounds like you've thought about it because you have. That's what you want for all your answers. You want to have them practiced and worked out and prepared. And ask someone for advice if you need to, you know, if you need help, like what are they looking for for this? Ask somebody. All right, be prepared for the call. So answer the phone professionally, get in the habit of doing that when you're on the job hunt. So even if you're not in the habit of doing it, make sure you're you're ready for it. Um, you know, again, don't block calls. You know, it's likely the call is going to come from someone you don't know. So answer it anyway. Uh, if you're shy or nervous, start working on that now. A lot of people are nervous about interviewing. They're shy. They don't feel comfortable talking. Join Toastmasters. Become a member of some organizations that require you to participate publicly. Be involved in committees whenever you can. Um, start working on honing those skills so you feel more comfortable. I, I never like, um, I'm not a fan. I'm, I'm an introvert, so I don't really like situations with a lot of people but I can fake it just fine if I have to, you know, I can look like I'm enjoying myself. And that's the key is just learning to do it. You don't have to like it, but you want to be able to come off as likable. Um, so we used to say, you know, would you be willing to have lunch with this person once a year? I used to put that on my list of questions for job applicants. It's probably illegal, but would you be willing to have lunch with this person? And if the answer is no, not really, I don't think I want to have lunch with this person once a year, then you're really, why would I hire you, right? If you're so boring, that no one would want to spend time with you. So you don't want to come off that way. All right. Um, uh, for full-time teaching positions, know the curriculum. Make sure you've studied their curriculum. Make sure you know what classes they offer. Make sure you know what you've read about them. Make sure you look at sample syllabi if they have them. Um, so that if I ask you about, so we've got a course on media, blah, blah, blah. Can you talk to me about how you teach that course? You've got an answer to that question. So be, and there are some samples of, on the list of questions about that sort of thing. So be aware of the curriculum, what they do, what they offer. If you can talk to current or former employees of the organization, you should do that. The correct answer to most questions as Maureen Taylor taught me 25 years ago is I can do that. If they, I can teach that. If they ask you with small exceptions, right? The answer is yes, not, eh, I don't think so. I mean, I wouldn't like to. Your answer is yes. I, I can do that. I will do that. I would enjoy doing that. That's the correct answer because all of this stuff is negotiable down the road. But in the interview, if you seem like you're going to be a pain, if you seem like you're going to be a, a, a poor member of the organization, why would we hire you? And um, wait until negotiations are over, until negotiations commence, you know, before you start asking questions about, you know, details about money or time or travel expenses or anything else. Save any of those those questions that are related to the to the job and money until you have an offer. Don't ask them. Uh, and I would add one last thing is just um, have some questions to ask if you go on a job interview of them. I always write about five questions that I can ask when I'm on the job interview that make me sound smart, you know, questions about like, so what are the students like? Or um, how's the climate of the organization? What's the climate of the department like? And understand that you can ask those same questions of everybody, because off like in the U.S. you interview with different people privately. Uh, in Australia, we don't. In my school, we don't do that. You know, you don't meet with anybody privately ever. But in the U.S., you might meet with a, with a dean, an associate dean, director of research, department head, faculty members, students, and you can ask those same questions of everybody because they're different groups of people. They don't know you just asked the person five minutes ago those same questions, and you get different answers from different people. So there's nothing wrong with asking it twice. But my point is just that you don't have to have 50 questions worked out. You only need to have half a dozen that you can use in a bunch of different ways. All right, so any questions about my part? I'm, a, I'm pretty much done with my slides. Dean raised his hand, it looks like. Let me get out of this window here. Dean. Yeah, um, if at all, how do you uh, answer questions that uh, suggest that they don't know what they're talking about? And that's not unusual in PR when you know, departments or um, institutions, oh, we need a PR program here. And and they oftentimes uh, preconceived. And I'm just kind of curious how candid you should be or just afterwards say, okay, I'm not going there. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, two things I would say. First off is, because uh, I've done this, I mean, don't talk out of your ass. 
You know, like when somebody asks you something, you don't know the answer to it. You just say, I don't know the answer to that, right? Don't try to fake it. Don't try to like, well, I think and just sort of make it up. Because I, I remember once getting asked about, uh, um, I don't know, some rhetorical uh, theorist concept back in the, back, you know, 25 years ago about some rhetorical theory that I sort of barely knew. And I didn't realize at the time the person I was talking to was an expert in that area. So I pulled out some bullshit answer. I don't think that's when I lost the job was that moment, but you need to be careful about that, that sort of thing. If you don't know, you just say, I don't know. Like I've called people back up with answers to questions that, you know, the next day um, and said, look, you asked well, me. What I'm asking here, Michael, yeah, I appreciate right. this, but right. what I'm asking is like, right. you just say, okay, these people really don't understand public relations like I right. do. And uh, I don't want to tell them that they're wrong. Uh, yeah. I probably am not interested in this job because I see them difficult. But do you have any advice as far as how to be candid in telling them or suggesting yeah. that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I think you're right. That does happen from, and you have like a, like I mentioned before, you've got people sort of out of touch with where the field is now, and they might ask you a question about something that's not exactly. relevant anymore. And I, um, I think you, you work out answers to questions like that, and there probably should be some of my list that get you there. But I would say my opinion is, of course, you don't want to tell them they're wrong. You might just say that, um, well, um, I think that the, you know, the approach would be to draw upon the latest insights in this area. So the Commission on Public Relations Education has suggested blah blah blah. And I think, you know, that's sort of the direction I would emphasize is to is to follow in the footsteps of best practices. So there's a way, I think, to sort of dodge that question, like you say, without having to tell them they don't know what they're talking about. And ideally, that's the best way. But sometimes you might not know and or ask them to elaborate, you know, ask them to give you a bit more so that they're sort of taking responsibility for the area. But I think that would be the, the best answer would be to be able to point to something that that you could say is the best practice now. Like a, an article just came out by Dean Krukeberg talking about blah, blah, blah. I think that's what we should be considering right now. That'd be a good answer as opposed to, yeah, you're not really up to date on this. But yeah, it's good. It's good. Good question. All right. So any others that somebody wants to ask? Okay, I think we have all our panel members here. At least I've seen people come and go, uh, and it looks like um, everyone here or, or is almost here or is here. So as I mentioned before, we would start with Joy Cipher because Joy said she has been up late already with school meetings and she'd like to go first. And so I guess maybe we'll do the U.S. people first, um, Joy, and then we've got Adam and Ame and Beth, and no particular order. So if one of you wants to go next, that's fine. But we'll start with Joy Cipher. Cypher. Uh, next, and, and Joy, let me give you permission in case anybody wants to be able to share their screen. I'm going to allow people to share screens. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Michael, thank you so much for inviting me. This is a great, uh, a great opportunity. I wish we had this when we were applying out for, for jobs. Uh, my name is Joy Cipher. I am a professor at Rowan University that's on the East Coast uh, of the U.S. in New Jersey. Um, I am pretty experienced with this. I was department chair. I have chaired four searches and successfully hired four people who are now my colleagues. I've been on an additional at least five searches. Um, if you add up all the pages of, of applications and, <laughs> and vitas and all of that, it would be astoundingly large. Uh, but this gives me a good sense of sort of historically how at least my program uh, works. Rowan used to be a teaching institution uh, and in the past 12 years has become an R2 institution with R1 aspirations. So I have also seen a significant change in what the university and even my department um, asks for and expects in the process. Uh, so I'm just, I started to go through the, the many options that Michael gave us to talk about and wanted to, to describe the things that uh, I think might be useful from the experience that I have. Um, one of the things that Michael asked about was uh, what does your school expect? Um, that's 
paraphrasing a little bit in terms of um, what do we expect when you come in to teach? We teach our, our faculty, our new faculty, teach two classes a semester. Uh, that's tenure track faculty, um, as well as research faculty teach two classes a semester. Um, when we were a teaching institution, it was four, but if you were research faculty, you would teach three. So these really are quite variable. Uh, from school and, and even across time. So making sure that you ask what the teaching load is and how that relates to the research expectations is especially important. Um, do not presume anything. I'm always surprised when people don't ask and how frequently people don't ask about the teaching load that we have to sort of volunteer it and then like, oh, oh, I, I, I didn't expect that. So don't presume anything about what teaching loads um, are. I really want to talk about some of the things that I strongly um, remind all applicants, and I in, fully intend to have this YouTube uh, video refer to all the people who apply in the future for jobs. So when they watch this, I don't have to have these same dilemmas. Um, number one, speak directly to the job ad. Job ads are written with, we have to, we, they're vetted through like many layers of the organization. This is not something that just somebody in a back room comes up with. This is vetted through many layers and it has to, um, meet a lot of different expectations. So it needs to be very specific. So when you are applying for a job, speak directly to the things in it. Um, if you're not qualified for it, don't waste your time. Don't waste somebody else's time. Um, when it's apparent that you're not qualified for it, it's the fastest, like, <laughs> we just don't read it. Um, so don't waste your time. It's not worth 10 minutes of your time to do that, yet alone, you know, the hour that you put to, to doing it. Um, uh, I would also, I would also say that uh, when you are speaking to the job ad in your cover letter, for instance, um, pay close attention to the things that we tell you we're looking for, because that is when Michael says, use the language that we use. Yes, pay close attention. If we have certain specializations that we're wanting, you should speak to that. You should bring that up. If you don't, I'm going to presume that either you're not a detail-oriented person, which is not the impression you want to make, or I might assume that you actually don't have that specialization, because if you did, you'd talk about it. Um, so remember, this is a rhetorical um, activity that you are engaging in, where you are making uh, an identification between yourself and the audience that you're speaking to. And so if you always keep that in the forefront of your mind, um, that will, will help. Um, pay attention if we say that we want uh, specific courses to be taught, that should be something you mention. Um, why you either are looking forward to teaching those courses or why you have the, the background to teach them. Um, uh, I would also, and I sort of want to go back to this uh, one thing that Michael said, the, the Maureen Taylor, yes, I can do that um, comment. Uh, at our university, especially because um, we are in transition to a higher research uh, set of expectations, tenure track jobs, the tenure file that you put together um, is tied to your job description. So if a job description, let's say, says, we expect you to teach courses in, and they list three things, when you come up for tenure, <laughs> they are looking for those three things. So if so, the one sort of caveat I would give to Maureen's like, yes, I can do that. If you can't or don't mm -hmm. intend to is, Understand that places like at my school, it, that is not negotiable later on. If I say we want you to teach communication ethics and you have no idea what to do with that and no intention of teaching com ethics, 
well, if you want to get tenure there, you're going to be teaching com ethics and we expect you to teach it well, right? So, so th that is one, um, you can always ask like, is this a requirement of the job or is this something you're just looking for? Um, it is much better for you to ask questions and, and be authentic about like, yeah, I don't really have any background in that. I would love to learn or, you know, are you expecting someone who's an expert or is this something you can grow into? Being, being honest about that um, is not selling yourself short. If that's, if that's really not what you want to do, then do you want to tie yourself to that job? You know, these, are, these are the kinds of hard questions that people aren't necessarily anticipating when they go into um, these things. Um, I really want to reiterate what Michael said about framing it as how you can fit into our department, because that's what we are looking for. Um, we know you need a job, uh, and hopefully the people you're interviewing with are sensitive to that and not arrogant about it. Um, and if they are, maybe that's worth considering too. Do you want to work with people who, who seem so callous at such an <laughs> important time? Um, but when you are speaking, frame it, always frame it as what you can do, what you can bring to the organization, how you see yourself as um, aiding them in their goals and their objectives. That brings me to my uh, third point, which is, again, I, I cannot say this enough, and I, I really appreciate Michael bringing it up, research the school. I'm not saying you have to read my articles. I'm not, you might not know anything about what I do. That's fine. But you should, if you're going to come in and, and want to get a job working with me, you should have some sense of what I do. You don't have to know the details of it necessarily, especially if it's different from your, your own scholarship. If we're in the same like specialty, you should probably know my work. Uh, but you should know about the university. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people, it, it, because it's so apparent that you don't, if people don't do the work of researching the school, the simplest thing will give it away. And you don't even realize that you've given it away, uh, but you really say, I've come here unprepared. And that is a horrible impression to make when somebody is spending two days interviewing you and you find out in the first hour, they haven't even bothered to look at the website for the the program they haven't looked at your curriculum they don't know in my case i'm at a school of communication in a communication studies department public relations is in a separate department if they don't even know that like i that that's beyond insulting to me to not even do the the most fundamental work on that and it happens a lot uh, it is it's appallingly bad um, so don't do that. <laughs> That's not an impression you want to make. Um, as far as the questions, have detailed, well-considered questions uh, that you come up with. Um, there are the questions that that people have, like you know, tell me a little bit about the neighborhood, that sort of stuff. That's for that's a conversation over dinner, um, not a conversation when you're meeting with faculty. But when you meet with faculty. Um, have something that really shows that you are a critical, deep thinker. Um, that impresses people. When, when, this, when someone comes in and they have a question where we sit back and go, nice. Now, like that, that really uh, becomes a resounding quality for an applicant. And those sorts of intangible things uh, make a significant difference, especially when you're competing against people who have very similar skill sets and similar uh, backgrounds, entry level positions, you know, that's, that's not all that uncommon. And so uh, aspects of a person's um, comfort in being able to sort of think in front of you and show that they're courageous enough uh, to not be a cookie cutter uh, sort of academic, that makes a difference. You want to be able to stand out. Are these are sorts of things you were looking for, Michael. Yes, those are those are good points. Exactly. 
Great. Um, we do. We expect, and, and let me. Uh, I'll wrap this up quickly. But um, as far as the process, we expect because we're R two. I feel like R two is like they expect everything. Right? So we want you to be um, a, a researcher that brings grants in. Um, we want you to be an excellent teacher. Uh, we don't want mediocrity. We want excellence in teaching. So we want you to be both of those. Um, and every place is going to need you to do service. That's just a fact. But R2s um, don't, you can't like buy yourself out of service. Um, and so the process for us involves uh, what seems like meeting with everyone. You meet with the dean. You meet with someone from the research office. Uh, you meet with uh, the chair of the department, you meet with the search committee, you meet with the faculty as a whole, um, which is usually where the big grilling questions come, uh, as well as you meet, uh, you do a teaching presentation in an actual classroom with our current students. Uh, you meet with some students separate from faculty, so it's just you and the students. Uh, and by the way, nothing is private in these conversations. Presume that we're going to ask the students how it goes. Uh, presume that we're going to ask the students how the teaching presentation goes. Um, uh, and you do a research presentation. All of that mean, and, and you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner with different faculty or students, which, which means from the time you're picked up at the airport to the time you're, you are dropped off at the airport, you are on. It is an exhausting process of a day to two days. Um, and so give as much rest as possible ahead of time. Um, the final thing uh, I wanted to say was about the letters. Uh, and one of the questions was about who writes them. Um, and this is my own personal opinion on this. Um, but this idea of, uh, is it better to have like a huge name in your field write a letter? or someone who knows you really well. Personally, for me, I have seen many mediocre milk toast letters from people who were big names in the field. Um, that, that helps me in absolutely no way. Uh, lazy writing, uh, someone who doesn't take the time, but just wants to basically use their name like a stamp and say, yeah, this is a good person. That doesn't help me. Those letters of recommendation tell me huge amounts about you and what your capabilities are, uh, the kinds of relationships that you develop with your mentors uh, and your teachers and your supervisors. And so having, I would much, I'm much more impressed by a detailed letter of recommendation from your advisor and two other people that you've worked with uh, in detail, who can speak to your teaching, who can speak to you as a researcher, uh, who can speak to you as a colleague, uh, than having someone in the field who really doesn't know you as well or chooses not to speak to that and just say, yeah, they're great. They do good work. They were great in my class. I would hire them. That, that's nothing. So pay close attention to the kinds of relationships um, and make sure that you talk with the people you're asking to write your letters um, about the kinds of things that you're trying to emphasize and what they think your strengths are. So you have a sense of how they would write about you. Okay. I'm going to stop there. All right. Thank you. Okay. So um, Beth asked if she could go next. She has, a, she's had an unstable connection going up and down. I, she's been solid for a while. I uh, can't tell. Oh, I see you smiling. So hopefully you won't have any trouble. So you want to go ahead and go next, Beth? Yes, thank you. I, I appreciate it. And I've enjoyed hearing from everyone. I, several of my notes I had made, um, we've covered. Sorry, my dogs. Uh, <laughs> once I start talking, they start uh, going at it with each other. Um, so I am, as uh, Maureen said earlier, I'm a professor and director at the University of Tennessee. Um, we had two former wonderful colleagues and Michael and Maureen. Um, I am actually a lifer at UT. Um, I have been there since I started and uh, entered academia in 2006. So I don't have a wealth of, I went on three interviews at that point. I don't have a wealth of experience 
going on interviews, but I am truly, um, I think most people in my college would agree I'm the professional uh, search committee member. I am on every possible search committee we have, and I enjoy it. It's one of the most important things we do as academics. I recently was on our dean search committee. That was a a massive experience and a, a director for another school. I chaired that last year and have been on dozens and dozens of faculty committees. So I, I have some experience there. Um, let's see, we use for our, um, you asked about the application process. We use Interfolio, which is an online um, application portal. I don't know if who else used it, but it's really nice, expedites the process, um, tells you exactly what you need to upload, won't even let you submit it till it's complete, uh, um, depending on the settings. Um, Dr. Ken asked us to talk about what makes a viable candidate and just kind of how you best position yourself. Um, and again, a lot of these things uh, Joy just covered. Uh, so I tried to strike it, but I apologize if I'm redundant. Um, we asked for a cover letter, CV, and three rec letters, which I, I our three recommendation names, which I'd say is kind of the standard. Um, uh, you know, if you make it into the interview phase, then we might get teaching evaluations and things like that. And um, we are, as a R1, we do require a, a 2 2 teaching load. Um, we do love to see classroom experience. And this is something I want to note because. Michael, you, you, might, you might differ or agree, but as an, even as a R1 teaching, we are still really teaching focused. Um, a lot of times when you think about an R1, um, you know, you think, oh, it doesn't matter how I do in the classroom as long as I do my research. And um, I interviewed at a place where it was just, I got an immediate sense um, that, um, you know, teaching was kind of on the back burner. All they cared about was how many publications you cranked out. And for me, that personally wasn't the kind of institution I was looking for. Um, so even within our ones, I would say they aren't all created equal. Um, you know, we totally expect our great teaching evaluations and great teachers. I saw someone just ask, what is an R1? Um, Michael, do you want to take that? Yeah, I was just getting ready to run out. So, so in the U.S., there's sort of this category system of universities, and R1 is sort of a research institution. It's sort of the um, um, usually higher ranked because research usually is valued more than teaching. But um, R1 is a research-based institution, institution where they expect you to do a lot of research. R2 was sort of a combination of them. R3, I'm not exactly sure what constitutes an R3 because there's there's sort of teaching institutions. And there are comprehensive, we call them comprehensive universities. I think R3 is more of a comprehensive university, but um, basically it comes down to how much teaching. In R1, you'll do less teaching than R2 usually, and R2 less teaching than R3, but everybody these days wants you to do research. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so one thing I would say, so again, even within those categories, you know, um, just because you're at a research school may or may not mean, you know, it changes how much the focus is on teaching too. We certainly expect, you know, a high level of engagement there. Um, so just, you know, really leverage your, your PhD experience. And I would say one thing I look at as a director and uh, you know, many search committees I was aware of is that there are certain classes and I don't want to disparage a class in case it's something when are you, one of you are teaching right now as a PhD student, but there's certain classes that kind of like everyone on the job market has taught that don't really add like a unique, you know, for example, it's very hard for us to find graphic design teachers, writing teachers and public relations can be very hard to find. So for me personally, my approach is like just today, I was meeting with a PhD student and I said, I'm going to position you in classes during your time here to make you marketable when you graduate. You're not just going to teach intro for three years. So I would say to the extent you can either, if you don't have a director who does that, like try to pursue it and, and seek those opportunities out because, you know, there's a lot of research superstars out there. There's a lot of great teachers teachers, but that's just another way you can distinguish yourself by teaching some of those rare skill set courses. Like I said, for us, it's graphic design and writing and those types of courses. Um, Dr. Ken asked us to speak about what we're looking for as far as research records. You know, it's not just the number of publications, but just the trajectory you're on and how much promise and potential and enthusiasm you show 
and even, you know, we don't expect you to be, you know, establishing a tenure stream yet. And, you know, um, it's fine to explore around, but it's also great if you can start showing a little bit of focus and where your research uh, might go. Um, let's see, our committees um, are usually four to five faculty members on the search committee. Um, this was spoken to about the cover letter. It's always good to tell why you're a unique fit. In addition to speaking to the qualifications in the job ad, tell why you're a unique fit for that university. You know, like I said, there's a whole lot of smart people out there, a whole lot of people who want that job, but what makes you a little different for that university in particular? So do your research, understand the school you're applying for, um, talk to people, talk to your networks. Academia is very, ancestral so to speak I, we're all connected and talk to people and kind of get a sense of what that school might be like um i would say um and she just spoke to this the most common mistake is we get applications that just are completely unqualified so so you don't want to waste time um our campus interviews are usually two nights um all your meals so like she said you're on from the time you step off that plane or out of the car you meet with people at a range of levels across the university and um, some schools and we do this sometimes arrange like a lunch with um, undergraduate students and if you are in one of those lunches don't make the mistake of thinking okay I can kind of let my guard down and pump them for kind of behind the scenes information because the undergrads are really great moles. They come back and report everything to us. So even when you're in more of those kind of like disarming, casual seeming situations, keep in mind that, um, you know, you're still being interviewed. Um, be ready for tough questions, but, at, um, you know, just stay calm is the main thing. Ask your advisor um, or a professor at your institution to practice your job talk, as we call it. That's the presentation you'll give. Um, the more you practice and have people who are going to ask you hard questions, get your PhD, your fellow students um, together and have them, you know, throw some hard questions and just practice, um, you know, staying calm and, and keep uh, there. Some institute, one institution I was at really tried their hardest to see if they could rattle me. <laughs> and um, it, it, it was a, a big uh, test of fortitude, but, um, you know, just kind of go into it. And, and you, you're, you're the expert in your dissertation or whatever. So stay calm and confident and just share what you know. Um, in your job talk, one of the biggest pitfalls I see there are people speaking too long, kind of like, well, if I talk forever and share more information, they're going to think I know that much more. And that is not the case. We want time to ask you questions. So I would be very explicit with the search committee chair and say exactly how long do you want me to speak and how long do you want me to leave for questions? Practice, practice, practice and time yourself and make sure you're not going to go over because that is the number one, I think, probably your job talk pitfall I see is they talk for 55 minutes and then the faculty have five minutes for questions and everybody kind of leaves a little unfulfilled. Um, but, but the search chair should be able to tell you exactly what to expect to that end. Um, I would say all academic searches these days move quicker and quicker. Um, it's very competitive, of course, getting those top applicants. So, um, you know, when I was interviewing many, many years ago, um, it, um, I think I did my interviews in December and people kind of started getting jobs around that time. And now we're, we're closing, we're hiring um, two, two assistant professors and an endowed professor right now. And um, we're closing, we're starting to review applications September 15th. So it's really gotten earlier for us in the academic year. Um, and then two last little things. Um, don't wait necessarily to the due date to when it says they're starting to review applications. Because <laughs> I, um, like I mentioned, we have several searches and I've already been in Interfolio. I go in every day just excitedly to see who all applied and those early names, you know, it almost sends a mes message of excitement and eagerness to apply for your position. So if it says we review September 15th, don't wait till midnight on the 14th to do that. Um, and then the last thing I would say is just like try to relax and enjoy the process we it is definitely excruciating and exhausting in a lot of ways but it's also you know you're keep in mind that you're they're selling themselves too and you're interviewing them just in some ways as much as they're interviewing you so um you know I know it's a luxury to think you you find the perfect job the first time but but do look for something that feels like a right fit for you because that first job um 
you know, if, for example, if you really want to be at a research intensive school and you take that first job at a, you know, and you're teaching a four, four, it's going to be very hard for you to do the research. It takes you to move into a more research oriented or research intense uh, university. So, um, I guess I try to give our PhD students a little more confidence on the interview circuit and, um, you know, to go in there and, and, and see it as an interview going both ways. Certainly, you know, all the things apply about being professional and, and staying on your game and all of it. Um, you know, ask, just be ready to ask them a lot of questions about what you're looking for too. So that, those are some of the biggies I would say after many years. And um, I just want to wish you all good luck in your pursuits. And thank you to Dr. Kent for doing such an important session. Okay, thank you, excellent. Uh, okay, so I had said, um, unless somebody else had sent me a message, no one has said they wanted to go next, we just stick with, we do the US first and then we move on to the next country. So if um, that works for everybody, if someone doesn't have to go, a couple people have poor connections. And so if we have, when we get, we'll worry about that when we get to it, but hopefully Adam's been pretty stable and Ame has been pretty stable. So we'll go ahead and go to Adam next, Adam Saffer. All right. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me, Michael. And it's been great to hear everyone's points on this. Um, so I don't want to reiterate a couple of the things that have been said, but I do want to just kind of sprinkle in a couple of insights that, that I have. So one thing I wanted to focus on is the, the research talk. And um, I have given several research talks. I was at the University of North Carolina for a while, applied for a couple of jobs, and then landed at the University of Minnesota. I've been on search committees and I would say the research talk is really, really important because your committee is going to be there, but also a lot of the faculty are going to be there and they're going to be kind of learning about what you're working on. And so you need to keep in mind that you can't possibly show everything that you're working on or every study that you've done. Some of the ones that um, the research talks that we had last year uh, that came through the University of Minnesota, it just was too packed and there wasn't a through line. So really kind of think about telling more of a deep story than showing, you know, the breadth of everything that you're trying to do. You can always, you know, share the other side projects outside of your primary area of research uh, during, you know, coffee or the one-on-one -on -one meetings or even the dinners, right? So what I would say is just really try to go for depth over breadth. Um, you know, of course, you're going to practice it and you're going to do all of those good things um, and just be confident in what you know and what you don't know. The worst thing to do is to comment on something that you don't know, or if you aren't familiar with the theory or a methods, you know, say, I'd love to talk to you more about that afterwards. I, I haven't come across that yet, but I think that it could really help me. Um, so just try and think of ways that you can, you know, uh, take their feedback um, or, uh, you know, try not to, to misspeak. So the research talk, I would say, is, is the one thing that I wanted to hit on. The other thing that I was going to say is uh, with the dinners, and this is the best tip that I got, and it has stuck with me. If you can see what restaurants you're going to, try to look at the menu before you get to the city that you're going to, right? Have a look at that menu and then think about what is the easiest thing that I could eat. Do not get spaghetti. Do not get the biggest meal. Like you're going to be doing a lot of talking and you, and you want to be doing a lot of talking. You want to be asking questions. You want to be learning about who your colleagues might be. So try and, you know, order something that's simple and that you can might have a couple of bites because uh, you're going to be doing a lot of the talking. So uh, that was uh, the one tip that I had there. The other thing that I would say um, that I noticed this past year with our applicants uh, the ones that stood out really could answer the question of why they wanted to come to the University of Minnesota. Now, everyone will come in and say, oh, you have great students, the faculty, all of this stuff. But whenever they gave a response that really showed how they fit in our department and why they wanted to come to our unit, it really made them stand out. So come up with a genuine reason why you want to end up where you're applying. Um, the, the, the last thing that I'll end on, just because I, I, I want to be brief, and I was hoping that we would have some time for questions at the end. Um, the last thing that I, that I will say is, is your cover letter. So going back to the very beginning, um, the cover letter, I would say, is your introduction to most of the faculty and committee members. 
Um, so really spend as much time on that as possible. Uh, you want to have words and descriptions that were in the job call. So if they are asking you to um, help support their oral communication program, you should probably know what that is, and you should probably have that mentioned in your cover letter. Maybe even like a full paragraph kind of describing that if it's something very specific. Now, if you don't know what something that they're asking for you to participate in, like the oral communication program, like let's say maybe they have a website that has four or five sentences on it, right? And you don't really know what it is. The thing that you can always do is reach out to the chair that's listed on the job call and say, might it be possible to have a quick chat? I want to learn more about this program before I uh, write up my cover letter. I want to think about how I can contribute. What are the skills that I could bring to this? Or, you know, I want to see what others, uh, peer institutions are doing. Um, you know, it can help you stand out from the other candidates. It can show that you're interested, that you went out of the way um, to, to really learn more about the school, and then you reflect and then put that in your cover letter. Um, and so with your cover letter, what I would say is that some people really try to, you know, give their entire research. They talk about their entire dissertation in two pages, which is never a good idea. It's never a good idea. Just give us something that will entice us to want to learn more and even say that. I read one that was really good this last year that said something like something to the effect of, um, I look forward to sharing more details about where my dissertation is at uh, if I get the opportunity to come to campus. Um, so that really kind of was like, I was like, well, I, I want to learn more about this person. So, um, you know, do things like that. And then what I would say is just make sure somebody reads your cover letter. Um, I'm not great at editing it, as my advisor will tell you. Um, having a second or third pair of eyes on your cover letter uh, can really help you out. Whenever I was at the University of North Carolina, I uh, saw one candidate who was removed because the committee member noticed a misspelling in their cover letter and they got fixated on that. And so they were dropped, which I'm not saying that that was the best move, but it does happen. You have some committee members that are quite particular. So just to you know, recap, I would say, think about your through line for your um, research talk. Think about something simple that you can do uh, to eat at, at dinner. Um, and then uh, you know, with your uh, cover letter, just make sure that you have words that appear in the job call and that you are thinking of ways that you can stand out from the other applicants. So those are kind of my tips that I have. Okay, excellent, thank you. Actually, Maureen used to tell me you're not really going to get to eat anything. So you're just going to, you know, you're just going to go there and talk. So you're absolutely right. You know, order something easy to eat, you know, that is not going to get in your clothes. <laughs> you can talk to people. It seems trivial, but it's important. Okay, Ame, you want to you want to pick up where Adam left off? Yeah, sure. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Ame Young. Um, I'm an associate professor from USC Edinburgh, um, so I'm on the West Coast. Um, so in the past uh, nine years, I've served on eight, seven different search committees. I feel like every year I'm on committee, including this year, <laughs> other than when I was on sabbatical. Um, a lot of the tips and experiences that I have sort of had is very much similar to what everybody else has said. Um, one thing I really want to emphasize is how much effort the search committee put into writing those job ads. Um, you really want to read it as a reverse pyramid. The most important stuff are always on the top. Those are the things that we painstakingly take several hours going back and forth, trying to make sure we get every detail right. Um, so when you present yourself, you want to kind of like focus on the, the things that are on the top. As you go down the list, go down the ladder, um, the things that are less important, like sometimes we would say, oh, we were, um, you know, in Los Angeles. <laughs> you don't want to start with, oh, I want, really want to come to Los Angeles. We know that. A lot of people want to come. Um, we want to focus on what we need, like what are the kind of expertise or um, sort of skills that you have. Um, and in terms of the type of candidates that are ideal, I think schools are on a spectrum in terms of how much they value research. Some schools, even though they are research one, but research is more like, uh, we want you to have good research. We also want you to be a good teacher. 
And then on the other end of the spectrum, research is the king. It's everything. Like that's going to be the predominant factor that's going to decide um, the decision making process. And we are kind of like, unfortunately, on the other end of the spectrum where research is really, really the most important thing. Um, so how do you stand out as a sort of a good candidate? Um, first of all, your research record should really be comparable to the existing faculty um, in similar areas. So if you're applying for a system professor job, you look at the recent hires. If you're applying for associate or full professor, again, you look at people who are currently there. Um, because we are, uh, for example, if I'm hiring a assistant professor and I'm currently an assistant professor, in the search committee and you are way different from me i would think oh, that's unfair <laughs> similarly i wouldn't want to work with someone who is you know significantly less productive or things like that so you want to show a record that is comparable to the existing faculty um, another thing is that when you go into the job talk um, for us that's extremely important a lot of times the decisions are made um, I think 90% of that can attribute to the performance that you had at the job talk. The job talks are huge events. We start to advertise those talks, you know, several weeks ahead of time. Everybody who has an important role to play in the process will be there, the dean, the directors, all the search committee members, and the, the rest of the um, tenure and tenure track faculty and graduate students. So your performance at the job talk is incredibly important. What we are looking for is to be impressed. Um, so you don't have to necessarily think about how can I tell you all about my dissertation? We don't wanna know that. <laughs> we wanna be impressed. Um, so many times our search committee, uh, search would actually failed because none of the candidates impressed us enough. And we are more than willing to restart the search the next year because um, to get tenure is difficult in a research institution like ours. Um, so we want to hire the kind of people who show the potential to be able to tenure here. And for you to do that, um, you want to think about what is the best study you have ever done that's incredibly impressive. Um, you want to centerpiece that and spend as much time as you can on that kind of stuff to impress people. Um, a few words of advice about things not to do. First of all, no matter how great you are, if you are not a good fit, do not apply. <laughs> so I have seen letters that are uh, resumes that are incredibly impressive, but they are not a good fit. They get screened out and we just feel a little bit offended because you wasted our time. Um, the second is don't get defensive during job talks. If you go present your work at a large department, such as ours, we have like more than 60 different faculties. A lot of people come to the talk with a very different perspective and they do ask questions, sometimes stupid questions, <laughs> but don't get offended or become defensive. Several of our really good candidates, they didn't make the final cut because they get very um, defensive and they start to kind of attack the person who's asking questions to some degree. And we sense that as being a sort of not such a great colleague. And we may feel like, okay, we really want to bring somebody who's constantly mad at us. <laughs> so that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, other than that, I think everything else is pretty um, similar to what everybody else has said. Okay, so thank you. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. And uh, kept a, kept it short so everybody else can jump in. Uh, who left? Okay, so we're moving on to a new country. I think that's everybody from the U.S. Um, I know that we've had um, some people say they had issues, but why don't we maybe try and do Australia next? If um, Kate, do you think you can get your system to work? Yours yeah. is fine, I think, right? Good. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. I've really enjoyed this so far, and I'm trying not to repeat what's come before. I'm mindful we've got, oh, I should introduce myself. So I'm Dr. Kate Fitch. I'm a senior lecturer in communication and media studies. I specialize in public relations at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, but I'm on sabbatical this semester and I'm currently a visiting fellow at Australian National University, ANU in Canberra, which is our lesser known capital city. Um, 
I wanted to start by talking a little bit about the Australian system because it's quite different from what I'm hearing around the US system, both in the expectations around the application process. And I also need to give you a little bit of background about the kind of tiers of universities that we have. So the elite universities in Australia are a group of eight, and these tend to be research intensive, um, traditional sandstone universities. They're relatively resource rich with a strong research support and culture. Um, I'm currently teaching, uh, Monash and ANU are both group of eight universities, but I've also um, for much of my career worked outside the group of eight system. And I'm really, and PR is often in a school of communication and media studies um, in Australia, but I'm really pleased Katarina's here because she teaches in a business school. So we'll have a different perspective on uh, um, the location of PR there. The um, public relations is probably better established as a program and a, of both study and research in the non-group of eight universities. Um, uh, those universities often were, came up in the 60s and 70s. So the elite universities have begun to teach public relations and strategic communication. From my perspective, they haven't invested well in it. I'm the only teaching research scholar at my university in PR. And I'll talk a little bit about those different roles shortly. Um, the other thing is the Australian system has five academic levels of appointment. Um, so that range from level A, associate lecturer, to professor, a full professor is level E. Most entry level positions would be B and C, lecturer and senior lecturer. Um, and a PhD is generally required for them. The, so D, I won't talk to the professoriate, the level D and E positions. At my university, you would have to be bringing in um, hundreds of thousands of dollars in research income to be appointed to that level. Um, so it's possible there could be a level A appointment. They're usually uh, on contract at my university and um, or for somebody who's still completing their PhD. If you're applying for a job in Australia, you should know the difference between a contract or fixed term position, which might be for three years, and a continuing position, which is what we would call tenure. Um, it doesn't work like it does in the US. There might be a three or five year probation period, but then, then you're, in, um, you're in a continuing position. You should also know the difference between uh, education and practice focused appointment versus a teaching research appointment. So I said I was the only PR academic at my university in a who's in a continuing position and a, in a teaching research appointment. So 40% of my workload is research. We have a 40-40-20 model, 20% is service, 40% is teaching, and 40% is research. Um, that does mean that my colleagues who teach into the public relations program are on contract and they're in education focused or practice focused positions. So they do not get the same level of support for research. Um, they do a lot more teaching than I do. And this is a trend I see across many universities in Australia, particularly in the public relations discipline. And I, as, as a scholar who would like to see greater um, recognition for public relations scholarship. And I think we have a number of scholars in Australia doing some fantastic work. Um, uh, this is disappointing for me that I'm not seeing that investment in, in kind of research positions going forward. But as a sort of entry level position, um, it, it might be the way in that you have an education focused role and then you apply elsewhere for a teaching research role. But it means you you're doing a lot of your research on the side, which is not ideal. Um, I've sat on many recruitment panels um, over the 20 years I've been in the university sector. At Monash, because it is um, a very a research intensive institution, we're looking for a potent, the potential of a candidate as well as their past achievements. So I'd expect in a cover letter to, or, and certainly in the interview, you'll be asked what you're working on and what your research plan is for the next three years. We take recruitment really seriously because we see it an investment 
in, in the school. And it's one of the few ways we can ensure the quality kind of academic profile going forward. So we would expect if we're offering a continuing position to a teaching research candidate that they're going to be with us for at least 10 years. Um, we've become much more rigorous around our appointments. So we've been, we fact check CVs and there's candidates that we would have made an appointment to until we started going through their CV and couldn't find, and I, I suspect and there's one case I'm thinking of where I think it was probably a messy CV or not carefully proofed, but there absolutely has to be a kind of acknowledgement if something's in press or under review. Um, and it was otherwise a very strong candidate, but it fell apart at the CV, le CV level and we didn't make a, an offer in, um, of appointment. The other thing is um, for a continuing position, we're looking for publications in top Q1 journals. And if you're not sure what Q1 is, it's the SJR um, ranking for a journal. Um, so they're in the top 25% in their fields and for PR, that's usually communication, um, public relations review, public relations inquiry, and journal of public relations research, uh, or Q1. Um, the major, um, what else was I going to say about that? Uh, one issue I see in Australia is that uh, a lot of communication and media studies scholars get appointed to public relations positions without really a strong track record in public relations or publishing in public relations journals. Um, I think there's a bit of repurposing of careers going on in order to get a job, which I can understand, but it's sometimes hard for public relations scholars to compete with others who published in higher ranked journals in communication and media studies. Um, it might say something about the choices people make where they publish and perhaps having a strategy that you're not just publishing in public relations journals, but in showing that you have impact beyond public relations might become more important as you um, move through your academic career. Um, so I, I agree with all the comments about the need to research your university, know what, read their strategic plan, know who the scholars are in the school, know what the research interests of your selection panel are, um, and be clear that you will be asked in the interview, who would you like to collaborate with in this school? It comes up almost every time. So you need to know enough about their work to be able to say, well, I'm, you know, based on the research I've done, I'm really interested in this and this, and I love the work that so-and-so does. So know who your future colleagues are going to be. They, they want to see that you're collegial and you've done that research. Um, you may also be asked, and we've asked this at um, interviews, you may also be asked which who, uh, who's a PR scholar you admire. I think, Michael Kent, you um, said this. We've had candidates who couldn't name a PR scholar. So obviously that, you know, that we're looking for critical scholars in the field. So they need to have, be able to locate their own work in relation to the field. I also think it's really important to get a scholar from the country, the tier of university or possibly the university you're applying to, to read your application. When I made the shift from a non-group of eight university to a group of eight university, I had colleagues in the UK and in Australia who worked at the top level universities read my application for me. And I got really good feedback and restructured it in ways that better met the criteria of a research intensive university. And I don't think I would have been appointed without that. To apply in Australia, um, certainly for BC, it's much, much less likely that you're going to be flowing in, going out for dinner and all those things. Generally, the appointment's based on three documents. So that would be a cover letter, selection criteria, and a, an academic CV. Um, and then there's usually just one interview with faculty for a BC appointment. I know the University of Canberra recently recruited and they did things a little bit differently, which I thought was interesting. They um, just asked you to upload a CV to um, a portal 
And then when you got through that initial screening, they asked you to prepare a 10 minute, 10, 15 minute video recording answering five questions, four or five questions, I think three to five, I'm not sure I didn't do it myself. Um, and then based on that screening, you were then invited to an interview. So I thought that was quite an interesting way of um, minimizing the amount of work involved in applying for a job. I wish more universities would do that, but I think we have a very formulaic way of doing this through HR. Um, and it's very rigorous in Australia. There's often an HR representative on the panel. You can only ask the same questions of each candidate. It's not usually many, maybe six, no more than 10 questions. Same person, you know, there's, there's a very formulaic template about how we go about this. Um, and I do recommend that you follow up and have a chat to the contact person. It's often the head of school or the head of a program or the academic director. Um, have a chat to them so they get to know you a little bit. Uh, that might be important and might allow you to be selected for the interview. But also, if you've got contacts and networks and that allows you to talk to somebody else in the school who's not involved in the selection panel, absolutely follow up with them and have a chat about the kind of um, ambitions of the school and the faculty and the kind of people who fit in there and, and, and get to know as much as you can about the place so you can tailor your application accordingly and also decide if that's the right fit for you and where you want to work. I think that's probably, um, I'm mindful of time, we're a really big panel, so I'm, I might leave it there, Michael. Okay, thank you, that was great. Uh, I don't see Katharina here. Um, she was up and then down. She said she was having trouble with her network. Am I missing her? Oh. I didn't see her on my list. So uh, uh, I've got, we've got they, we have three people left. So Petra or Regina, which would you wanna, one of you wanna go first? Petra flashed on. I think you're muted. I can't hear you, Petra. Okay, I'm back. I'm I'm muted. Okay, you want to go next? Um, yeah, I think because a lot of things that Kate actually said applies to us as well. Um, we are slightly different, so I I'm going to keep it quite short. Firstly, New Zealand doesn't have a lot of universities. We've got eight universities, of which one of them I believe is private, Lincoln University. Um. AUT is, is one of the most well-known schools when it comes to public relations. We, so let me introduce myself first. I'm Petra Tennyson. Um, I've been at AUT or Auckland University of Technology for a good 20 years now. And I've sat on a few panels. It's to be very honest, I'm one of those people, it's not my favorite thing to do um, for a number of reasons, because it's not as Michael had said, it's not a very objective process it's not a very rational process um and i think for a young scholar who comes in that might be a big surprise because they often think they're going to be hired based solely on either their qualifications or their research um in um myself i have tried I, I in South Africa I've tried many times I've gone for many 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 interviews so I've seen it from both sides from being interviewed as well as going through the process so I'm going to share the process the way it's done in New Zealand and the way it's done correctly or how it should be done in New Zealand um, so we don't have, firstly, we also don't have levels. So Kate mentioned the different levels, the A, the B, et cetera, great. We don't have it. I also wanted to emphasize to people who are coming from other countries how important the culture is. So I thought what um, Kate had said, have someone read from the country is quite a good thing for your, um, your cover letter and your CV. Um, different cultures require different types of approaches. So I think be mindful of that. If there's one thing that I would like to say is here yeah, at AUT, we are always looking for an all rounder. So research is important. Teaching is important. Service is important. Those three things. So even if you're not a great researcher, but you're a good teacher, and you have some really good service, maybe volunteering in the community or working with practice, that actually beefs up your CV. And for a newcomer, that's quite important because 
um, as, as many of you have said, you don't always have the research output that you would like to see. What we would be hiring for is often potential for a newcomer. Again, uh, with a culture, be, please be aware of the different terminology. So in America, we would talk about professor. We do not talk about professor. For us, a professor is a rank. So don't say you're applying for a professorship because that's a rank. You would be starting at a lecturing role, a lectureship, which is the beginning. And just for interest sake, in different countries, um, there's actually a junior lecture role that you might be starting as well. So be very mindful of the lecturing level that you are asking for. We actually have a prescribed standard requirements for a lecture role. So you need to look at that job description. Again, it covers things like being able to work in a team, um, being um, research active um, and doing service, those three areas to look at. Um, the one thing I disagreed with Michael is Michael was talking about these. I, I, I agree with not writing a four page application letter, but I'm actually a huge fan of a short and crisp application letter. I find it really frustrating when a person writes um, three, four, six pages. I've seen some that I'm just wading through and they're waxing lyrical about how wonderful they are, etc. Everyone is wonderful, okay? Everyone that applies for it is wonderful. So when we get the applications, we actually go through a process of elimination. So just in terms of that a newcomer will understand is we're looking, do you match the criteria? Do you have a public relations qualification or something that's related? Um, do you understand public relations? And that's what you should be covering in your cover letter because many people come from adjacent areas like marketing or advertising. Um, I've seen people apply for a public relations jobs who have absolutely no background, no qualifications in public relations, but you know, everyone can do public relations. Um, no, you can't. So there's a good chance that you will be eliminated from the process. We only interview about three to five people because we are time short. So to make that list, you really need to fit the criteria. And I agree, you don't have to be perfect. The thing that we are looking for is team fit um, because, and I think one of the, uh, my American colleagues mentioned that, look at your workload, please look at your workload. Workload is very high. You're not just going to be sitting in your office doing your research, you are actually going to be teaching and teaching um, can be quite, quite demanding. Um, sometimes a newcomer, um, and I say specifically newcomer, will apply because they've got a PhD, they've got research outputs, they come and they think I'm going to do a lot of research and they have neglected to tell us their teaching experience. We are looking for someone who can teach. Now, here's the thing that I really want to emphasize even between Australia and New Zealand is there are different models of teaching. So one of the things in the interviews that I've picked up is that um, people are unfamiliar with the different models of teaching. So some who have some teaching experience will come in and they will assume that there will be one person who prepares all the material and they will go in and deliver it. This is not the model that we normally use. We work as a team together on preparing the material. So just be mindful that you don't come in and think that the material will be given to you and you will go out and teach. What we're looking for is someone who can say, I can contribute. I have some ideas of how we can teach better, how we can do this better. So you'll see that I talk a lot about teaching. The research is a given, but the teaching is equally important for us specifically at AUT. Um, Michael asked us to talk about writing samples. Um, it's quite interesting because I think there's a bit of a, a different point of view of what public relations is about. 
We don't ask for writing examples, but I can tell you that I will be looking at the cover letter. If the cover letter is badly written, um, you probably won't make the list because to me, that's an indication that you can't write. Okay, so I'm not even going to give you a test because clearly you can't write. Um, so poor language errors, etc. I mean, one tiny error is not going to be a deal breaker, but badly phrased letter, poor grammar, no spell checking, that's out. Okay, um, because it's just untidy. Um, and it sounds quite rough on that. He also asked us to talk about who makes the decision. Um, usually for us, it's the hiring manager that makes the decision. But the hiring manager is not always the chair of, of the panel. And the panel has got quite a strong input. Be very careful in the interview, not just talk to everyone on the panel. Don't assume that the quiet one is not the one that makes a decision. The quiet one might be the most powerful person in that panel to make the decision. So just be mindful to be friendly to everyone. A tip that I've learned over the years is when you come in, be also conscious about how you speak to the supporting staff, the receptionist, um, the cleaner or whatever, because you'd be surprised in New Zealand, it's a small country, we talk to everyone. And when we are unsure, we ask, for instance, a receptionist pure point of view and say, how did you experience the person? And they'll come back, oh, they were really rude to me. Guess what? You might not make it to the shortlist, or you might not make it to that final interview. So be mindful how you treat every single person in the interview. Don't assume that they are lower levels or they don't make the decision, therefore you don't talk to them. Um, what was the other one? Yeah, we're looking for potential usually when we're going. Um, I, I mentioned the, um, the culture. Again, culture is quite important and maybe some of the common mistakes that I've seen people make, um, besides being rude to some people, is don't reschedule an interview because um, you've got something more important to do. Things do happen, we understand. But don't, for instance, say you can't attend an interview because you're currently at a conference. You can take that hour and you can do that interview remotely through um, Zoom or whatever, um, there's really no excuse. Remember that you're actually messing around the panel who's very busy, who has to put time aside to interview you. So unless it's an absolute emergency and you know someone is sick or something is happening, please do not reschedule your meeting or interview for any reason other than an emergency. Um, don't try and ingratiate yourself by thinking that uh, you have something in common with a person. Um, I find that when people know that I've lived in South Africa, they might um, think that I'm Afrikaans and then address me with an Afrikaans greeting or say something that they think would ingratiate themselves. It's not appropriate. We are in a different country, in a different situation. Just be professional. Don't, don't try that because it doesn't work. Um, yeah, and applying for PR without any specific knowledge or background is probably not ideal. Um, a minimum requirement for a lecturer is usually to have a master's degree. Ideally, because competition is tough and the tougher it gets, the higher your qualifications, the better. So if you are busy with a PhD, that's fine. Don't worry if you haven't finished your PhD because you could potentially, um, you just have to demonstrate that you most likely will finish it. Um, and there can be contracts worked into it. But 
a mistake that you might or that I've seen people make is saying seem lukewarm about continuing further studies or doing research because it's hard work um, that usually you know um, puts you at the bottom of the list so that in a nutshell is it I'm, I'm not going to hopefully there will be some questions at the end and I'm just going to stop here okay very nice. I think both Kate and you made some good points about the cultural differences and how important that is when you you understand them when you're making choices about the application. So I think those are good points to consider. Okay, so it looks like we're down to our last speaker, which is great because I'm running out of time and they'll be throwing us out of our hotel in a second. So I want to have time for questions. So Regina will be our last speaker. If you uh, want to go ahead and go. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for inviting me, Michael. And I'm Regina Chen, and I'm an associate professor and associate head in the Department of Communication Studies at Hong Kong Baptist University. And we do have a school of communication, which is uh, uh, probably like number one communication school in Hong Kong, uh, regarding to the latest uh, uh, research assessment uh, results. And then I think my job here today is really just to bring out the differences and similarities in terms of the uh, job searching and recruitment process between different countries, especially some of you might have interest in Hong Kong. And uh, so I think my presentation will be relatively short and I just want to focus on the differences and also trying to give you the confidence that actually Hong Kong is an international city. We do um, global search all the time. So all the process is uh, very, very identical to the ones in the United States, especially uh, comparable to the ones for research one universities. And I think that is also quite similar to UK's as well. And that also shows that all my faculty members pretty much uh, were hired from outside of Hong Kong. So I think the uh, majority of us were hired from the United States and uh, um, UK. Um, and so I think uh, the entire process is really very identical. So um, the only difference is I think some of the universities in Hong Kong would have the campus interviews and some like us at HKPU, we do not do uh, campus interviews because we don't have the time and the budget, but we do like online interviews and then we will invite uh, the, shortlist inter uh, the, 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 the shortlist candidates to give us a job talk, uh, focusing, on your, uh, focusing on the research. And then uh, the committee members will ask various questions. So that means that for every applicant, uh, if you want to uh, apply for a job in Hong Kong, uh, the first thing is that you need to make sure that you um, write the, send me the right documents, uh, like I may enjoy and other panelists have already mentioned you have to respond to the ad. You need to read it very carefully in terms of how you make yourself as a unique feed to the position that we are asking, and also the unique feed to the department. We really uh, want to find people that can give us a good addition. So you need to demonstrate that in your writing, uh, in both your CV, your cover letter, and also your uh, recommendation letters. So um, the whole process simply is that um, all our faculty members will read through all the applicants uh, when they are interested, and then they will make the short list, uh, uh, they will make the recommendations uh, to the committee, and the committee will make the short list uh, and invite the candidates on the short list to do the interviews. So the first thing is that really uh, treat seriously to all the documents that you send in, and that is your first and most important opportunity to demonstrate yourself to say why you uh, out, uh, how, why you are outstanding from the others, why you need to have the job. So um, the, uh, the 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 largest mistake that I have seen um, over the past years that I have served on various uh, search committees in our university and also particularly in my school is really some of the candidates uh, don't study well our department or don't study well the entire research portfolio of the school. And for instance, my department uh, only do empirical research. And then we have a very specific focus on strategic communication. And we will not, we will not hire anyone uh, who is doing critical study or doing, um, you know, um, um, culture studies because that's not our uh, research portfolio. And then if you, um, 
if you are doing uh, this kind of research, you won't feel comfortable in your department too uh, either. So we will not look at uh, applicants uh, who are not empir empiricalists, even though we will not write that in our ad advertisement. But if you are a smart candidate, you should, uh, I mean, applicant, you should go to the department uh, website and also go, also go to the school website to see that. So that's very important. The first thing that I want to really emphasize is that treat your uh, documents, whatever that you submitted, that we ask you to submit, very, very seriously. Of course, that means that you need to ask your colleagues to take a look, you need to do the editing, you need to make sure that there's no, no mistakes. And um, the other thing that I think is quite different in Hong Kong right now is that we pay particular particular attention to external grants. So um, sometimes that is the must criteria for you to get tenure in our program. So it's very important that we need to see that uh, any applicant demonstrate that potential to be able to bring in external, especially competitive grants to the program. And uh, um, so I think that is a, a little bit different from uh, several years in Hong Kong and probably that still is not a must for programs in the United States or in UK. But I think that's a trend in Hong Kong and that's important to demonstrate that. And uh, um, I think the last thing um, that I want to emphasize is really, uh, even though I know that, even though I say that whole, the whole process is quite similar to the ones in the United States or in Hong Kong, but we do appreciate people or we do need people to show that you have interest in Hong Kong and you know how you um, apply those theories or even your own research to the context of Hong Kong or greater China, because they can really demonstrate the uh, competitiveness of our research portfolio of the department or of the school. And also uh, we treat teaching very seriously. So our students, uh, if you're in Hong Kong, you know everybody's very pragmatic. We are in a very competitive society. So our students, at, various levels, they know uh, what their goals are and they want their uh, teachers, their instructors, their professors can facilitate them to achieve their goals. So it's extremely important that you demonstrate that you have the local knowledge to um, offer the good teaching criteria uh, quality to our students. So even though we do appreciate and we do all the international research uh, collaborations, but at the, at the end of the day, we need to, our candidate to show that they can apply. They have uh, uh, whatever they have researched or whatever they have uh, known to the local context. Um, so I think, um, yeah, so I think those are the things uh, in addition to what others have already said. So if you have any further questions, just let me know. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you. As Joy had said said earlier privately that like I wish we had known all this stuff when we were undergrad or when we were graduate students looking for jobs. So um, we have some time for questions. This is really the the most important part of this probably for some people. We don't have that many non-presenters, but does anybody in the audience want to ask something, a specific question? Dean, you got your hand up? Yeah, um, a couple of things. One, uh, uh, just a comment. Um, I have to answer uh, one question uh, that would not be received well. It'd be like uh, collaborating with people in the department. My policy as a personal policy, I don't ask anyone else to share is, I never work with people in my own department. Generally, I only work with about two or three people anyhow, but if something goes south, I don't want to meet that guy in the hallway, you know, so my policy is us. No, I, I don't work with people in my department. Uh, there's just too many things can go wrong, but that isn't what people are looking for. I'm, 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 I think you all mentioned this, and I'd be kind of curious how they would uh, recommend answering this. How do you operationalize good teaching, outcomes-based, student satisfaction-based, uh, everybody wants a good teacher, but uh, there seems to be uh, uh, at best a vagueness, but oftentimes uh, like, uh, uh, you know, they'll take one or the other, oh, you know, students are gonna give you all a high, you know, number five marks, you know, uh, which may not reflect that you're a good teacher, might reflect some other things. Uh, outcomes, which to me makes sense, like, oh, these kids are actually employable, um, they actually get a job. But uh, I'm, I'm kind of curious how people would feel in a question like that. Okay, Petra, you've got your hand up there. Um, it's an interesting question, Dean, because 
Um, we don't, in the interviews, we don't actually ask them to demonstrate. When they've already done teaching, they would have had teaching appraisals done by students. So they are welcome to share that in the meeting or in the, in the interviews. And we might ask them if they have anything that they could share. So my advice to a new person is if you have done some teaching, even if it's you know, just a semester of teaching. If you have student appraisals and they're good, share them with us. But in terms of our own mm -hmm. teaching, we use reflective practice a lot. And so a newcomer, we don't expect to have all the skills. I think what we're looking for is potential um, because they'll grow into, develop it. So when it comes to interviewing a person, Research is great if they have research, but it doesn't make them a good teacher mm -hmm. and um, or educators. So we will ask specific questions. But on the other hand, um, they have to show an interest in education mm -hmm. or an interest in teaching. And because we've got a lot of experience and we, we teach in teams, that's my point earlier of the different teaching models, we teach in teams where people actually contribute their ideas for the week on how to teach certain things. And so that's what that's where they actually will develop their teaching skills. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, Dean, if that answers it, but we do student evaluations. But that's a topic for something else, because I'm very critical of those. <laughs> OK, Joy, you want to respond? Uh, I think yes, may. thank you. Um, I would I would answer your question, Dean, with three things. Um, number one, uh, we ask people to do a teaching presentation so that we can see them in action. And and one of the things that I strongly encourage people who are applying um, is to get as much information as possible about the class you're going into, the level of student you're you're going to be teaching, and teach to that level. Do not lowball your teaching. Um, don't and and rarely have I seen somebody sort of go above the students' heads. It seems like everyone's always too worried about that. Uh, but if you come in and you teach, at far below the level, our students are insulted. Faculty are like, what? Well, I have no idea what their skill set is. They're not gonna be coming in to teach this sort of stuff. We wanna see you teach what you will be teaching. Um, and so that's a really excellent um, way. Uh, we ask in our application, we ask for uh, applicants to explain their teaching philosophy, which is usually about a page, but that really speaks to some of what Petra invoked with that reflexive um, consideration, like let help me understand what it is that that you bring to the table, even if you don't have a lot of experience, what is it that you, how do you understand what happens in the classroom and your role and the role of students together? So if, if you can, even if you don't have a lot of experience under your belt, but you have really considered this, that's, that sort of speaks to the work in progress. And finally, are you mentorable? Um, that that is huge. We expect people to come in with more than just limited teaching experience, but we have brought people in um, who haven't had as much as other candidates, uh, but we brought them in because it was clear to us that they were mentorable to become the excellent teachers we're looking for. Regina, you have your hand up? Yeah, can I, uh, yeah, I just want to add at some point right now, especially after the COVID period and also the social movement in Hong Kong. So we pay lots of attention to online teaching and learning in Hong Kong nowadays. So if you are at the uh, 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 assistant professor level, uh, as I already talked, we don't have campus interviews. So we don't ask uh, candidates or applicants to do uh, teaching presentations. And then your best shot is really when you do your research talk. That's the time that we see uh, whether you have the uh, to be a good teacher. Well. 
So uh, being within the time, uh, if we say 20 minutes, then you should finish the presentation in 20 minutes. And then you should uh, establish good engagement with your committee members. You should show a good personality and then you should make your message clear. So all of these are the indicators that we use to judge whether you can be a good teacher. And the second thing is really nowadays we're looking to, in addition to your uh, pedagogy and also how you will express yourself in the online teaching environment, whether you have any innovative ideas or uh, whether you, you will try any, any, any new ways of teaching, whether you're good at using those technologies. And those are the things that we're, that we're looking to when we judge a, 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 a candidate's teaching ability. And the other things uh, that Dean mentioned about is really collaboration with your uh, colleagues. And then actually, I would say in my institution, that is very important. We treat that as also a way, an indicator to see whether that candidate is a fit to our department and also to the school. So if, uh, if the candidate can answer the question in a nice and very innovative way, and then we will get a higher weight to the candidate for sure. Shima, you had your hand up next. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for all the great comments. Uh, and I'm very happy that this panel is being recorded because I need to go over the comments again and take notes carefully. Uh, my question is, how should we address those items in job advertisements that we don't have any experience in? Um, for example, many job advertisements in Australia for the lecturer position, they ask for mentorship experience, um, mentoring um, postgrad and students while me as a PhD graduate, a recent PhD graduate, I don't get the opportunity to mentor postgraduate, other postgraduate students. Uh, how should I address this? Um, should I just leave it out of my application or should I um, come up with a way to address it in some way? Thank you. Okay, Kate, yeah, I think you're the first with your hand up. A good, good question. Um, you can't leave it out if it's in the selection criteria. You absolutely have to address it. And I would be really upfront and say, you know, as a PhD student, I have had limited opportunities um, to mentor others. However, and then you could talk to perhaps peer mentoring that you've done with other PhD students um, and your interest in it. So don't try and... Um, overstate what you've done or the but you can say I've had limited opportunities to, to do this and the panel will understand that very much but so you respond to it in some way um, acknowledge that your opportunities have been limited but also show how you might have potential to mentor others or be collegial okay good thank you just a second we've got somebody knocking our door and I think I'm going to have to move out into the hall and uh I, I want people to, um, I want everyone to be able to ask questions. If you can give me just a second to roll my stuff out here by the elevator, we can uh, continue with any other questions. I think that's a, a good answer on that question. Are there um, others, other questions for other panelists, things people wanna ask? No? I would say, um, even if you, given that example, even if you can't meet every single selection criteria, it's actually really hard to get a good hire in Australia and it's still worth applying. Um, and what we talk about a lot at Monash is relative to opportunity. If you're still a PhD student with limited teaching experience, it'll be recognized that relative to the opportunities you've had, this is what you can offer. So it wouldn't be held against you necessarily. Okay, I, and I think that's true for any of these things. I think we this came up earlier is just this idea of being honest about your skill set. Don't try to deceive anybody. Don't try to say that uh, you know, oh, uh, I can do that. Or I'm, I, if you don't know something, if you don't know the answer to something, if you don't have the experience, just say it and be as you know, try to make it as compelling as you can. As Kate suggested, you can talk about mentorship of other undergraduate students or something like that, or maybe past work outside of the academy. 
Okay. Other questions? Okay, I'm not gonna drag him out of you because I'm sitting by the elevator here in the hallway. So I want to thank all of my friends and colleagues and visitors for coming. And it's a great panel, I think. It was a nice job. Good, yeah. good answers. Uh, these are really great. Thank you for uh, everybody, but uh, uh, for uh, these Sydney lectures, uh, they're really, uh, really get some good discussion by expert people on good, on important issues. I really enjoy it. And it, thanks. And if any of you didn't notice, a whole bunch of job possibilities were posted by people. It's like a go, it's when you go to the business meeting at, at a conference, and at the end, everyone's like, I got a job at high school. I got a job at high school. So, uh, you know, you might make note of that if you didn't see the, I have the uh, transcript I'll have saved if you need a copy of it. All right, I got to go. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a good afternoon or evening, wherever it is for you. Thank you very much, Michael, and everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.